Open the pod bay doors, though. I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. What would you do with a brain if you had one? Do? Why, if I had a brain, I could... Miles per hour. I could buy a... 46. 56. So I, I, I had fun time watching this film because I, I grew up with a lot of people that were exactly David in the film, you know, as birders and that. And I started to think, how do I make that connection from the movie you just watched to m me and the birds that I deal with, Peregrine Falcons and their story? So the first thing um, I was thinking of, okay, it focused around family and relationships and you had the wedding at the end and could I make that connection through family? I'm thinking, well, here's my parents, and um, I grew up with both parents together, and their whole life, their dad passed away a few years ago, um, so that's not quite there. Of course, we did have a lovable rogue in the family. Look at that handsome little groom, uh, bell, or ring carrier. That's how I couldn't think of it, in the front. Um, so every family has their relationship and challenges, but that wasn't going to make the connections. So then I went to, um, David grew up as a birder, and he had a passion for birding, and could it be that connection and that passion? Um, unfortunately, I did not grow up as a birder. I wanted to be a fireman when I grew up. I didn't, you know, then birding came along much, much later on. So, okay, what's the next thing I could think of to try to make that connection is, okay, I work at the Field Museum and with a bunch of ornithologists. And, and after 30 years of peregrines, you might say you're the expert on that. So can I make that connection through being that um, authority figure? And I think that's a little debatable and questionable. Um, here's a group of people at the Field Museum, the ornithologists that I work with it. And like I said, they're just like the people in their, um, that story. Grew up as birders, phenomenal about the birding world. And I would say, while my knowledge has grown, it is a little bit challenging. And here's an example. And ducks are the connection I came up with making. So this is the stuffed duck that I grew up with on the wall at home. And it must be a mallard, right? Remember when they saw the mallard on the pond? Because that's the showy, flashy duck, right? This is what a mallard looks like. You're right. I heard somebody call it out. What it is is a male wood duck. I, you couldn't be more wrong in picking the showiest male duck and calling it by one of the more common, blander, um, ordinary looking ducks names. So maybe you can question my authority on, um, you know, birds and making that connection. But ducks would be a good place to start with. So what David was looking for was an extinct Labrador duck. This is a mount of one. It's a bird that went extinct in the late 1870s. Um, is known by just few records. Um, they were looking at what probably was a female one. They were trying to guess it would look like that. And it's a bird that was rare even when Europeans came to North America and that. It, it wintered up in Canada and Labrador and bred up there and then would come down in non-breeding time and be along the eastern seaboard, so the New Jersey and, and, and that coast. Um, they're not sure what happened and why it went extinct, but what they say is they didn't think it was hunting. What I was reading the other day was that they um, spoiled fast and tasted awful, so that doesn't go. Uh, but they were vulnerable to egg collectors. They were vulnerable to changes in the habitat that we made. And the last thing is um, people were hunting what they preyed on. And here's the perfect connection to peregrine falcons. You had a bird that was rare, that wasn't common, that went extinct because of man's influences and influences around where it lived and what it ate. So that was true, same thing with the peregrine and their story. So let me talk a little bit through the peregrine and um, what happened to it and what we do now. And then I have the live peregrine that I'm going to bring out so you guys could see. So you have peregrines are a bird that's found worldwide, every continent except Antarctica. All the gray area where you see E, that's areas that in, by the 1960s they were being um, extant from. So declining worldwide. Uh, 
They were a naturally cliff-dwelling bird, uh, fed on other birds. So for Illinois, you're talking along the Illinois uh, Wabash rivers along the Mississippi River. Our state never had that many. But we had about 350 pairs that were in the Midwestern and Eastern part of the US. By the 1960s, you had none. And the problem was uh, DDT that was spread on crops in the 40s to kill the bugs. And then the songbirds came and ate the dead bugs. And as you work up the food chain, the body of the peregrine didn't break it down. It accumulated and it inhibited calcium production. And calcium is what makes our bones strong. It's what makes the eggs strong. So the weight of the adults was essentially crushing their own eggs and not producing. In the map, you can see just along the western part of the US where you had some few pairs trying to breed. And it was those pairs with the crushed shells that scientists went and collect, came to museums like the Field Museum, looked at our eggs from the 1800s, and said, wait a minute, these fragments are much thinner and what is causing it? And then figured out the DDT problem. So on areas where you still had them nesting, you could go and repel to the nest, take the eggs with the thin shells out, um, put them in uh, incubators to hatch safely, put fake eggs out so your adults stayed breeding. And then when the young were about 10 days old in that, um, put them back to the eyrie and the adults would take them fine. Now keep in mind that weird puppet picture up front because when I get Molly out, I'm gonna explain that a little bit more. What do you do in the Midwestern and the Eastern part of the US where you didn't have any? And the answer was in a way falconry birds. We learned that we can breed these birds in captivity and they can learn how to fly and hunt on their own. So as long as they're not shown the wrong thing, they'll figure it out for themselves. So we used these captive bred birds and released them at these special um, sites. Uh, and that became the start of the wild population that you have out there now. So you have those wild birds um, choosing their iris and you would hope they would go back to historic cliff sites like this. This is one up in Minnesota. And, that, and all those little ledges. Where they started showing up was in cities. And if you think about it, the city is nothing but a pseudo cliff. You have ample prey, you have all these ledges that they can use, you have little competition for use of the ledges. At least you did when I started about 30 years ago. And um, so as those hacked out birds came and started bringing the cities and produced young and then they were fledging, your wild population got high enough that you basically, everybody stopped um, releasing captive bred birds by the early 90s. So here, we're, we're downtown Chicago right now, right across from the Willis Tower, Sears Tower. And this was the site where the first parents um, chose to, found it on their own, chose to bred after that decline. So from 1951 to 1987, we didn't have any nesting pairs in the state. And I look at that little, in the, the where they laid the eggs is where the little arrow is. Um, it, it is beautiful. It's just like a cliff ledge. It's not so deep that she can't see up in her, her surroundings while they're incubating them. They uh, are out of the wind, protecting from the natural wind. It's just a beautiful sight. If you're wondering how I access that for banding, and, and I'll talk about banding in a bit, see the little gray door to the right of the arrow? I can go out that little door. I used to have to, you used to have to climb down from the roof where the fans are. And that, that little ledge, you're on about 38. You know, there are 38 stories. All right, so let, let's, now that you got the wild birds out there and that, I'm gonna walk you through a little bit of a season and, and tell you what I do. Um, what we do. So their, their nest is nothing but a depression in whatever substrate that would be on that ledge. In this case, it's gravel. For us, courtship is February, March, and in March, beginning of April, they're laying eggs. Both male and females will incubate them. They incubate them for roughly about a month, and then they're hatching. Because they delay the incubation, to the clutch is almost complete, then they usually they, um, hatch within the uh, same day, one or two days, because they can lay one egg every 24, 48 hours. Um, so right now we're about Mother's Day in time-wise. Now the defensiveness of an adult really kicks into gear. And that if, you, if you're a birder at all and you've ever been out birding and you've been bopped in the head by a red-winged blackbird, peregrines do the same thing, but you're talking a bigger bird that has a higher speed. 
So if we want to grow out and grab those chicks for banding, and this is the age that we would want to grab them. The chicks are now about 24 days old. They're as big as they're going to get, so I don't have to worry about any bands outgrowing the legs. But they don't have their flight feathers yet, so I don't have to worry about prematurely fledging them out of the nest. And we're going to wear like bike helmets. The colleague behind me is Josh Engel. If, if you're into birding around here, you certainly know Josh. Um, the bike helmets are not because if I fall the 18, this is 18 stories, it's going to do me any good. It's because of that adult that might hit you. And we're actually using the brooms the same way. Because they're going to hit the high point or the point closer, they can safely go through the bristles at the end of the whisk broom and not hurt us. So why we have these chicks in hand, we're going to study as much as we can. And if there was any risk that the adults wouldn't take them back, we wouldn't be going through that. But the adults will. Um, so upper right, we're putting bands on. Those are unique to the individual. So I can look at longevity and dispersal. Um, so I know one that fledged from Evanston Library, say, is now breeding in Indiana. Or the one that's um, the male at Evanston, I can tell you right now, is 14 years old. That's old for a peregrine. They can live up to about 20 captivity. Lower right, we're taking a little blood sample. We could look at uh, genetics. We've had somebody from New Zealand that was interested in bloodborne parasites. Um, the one on the lower left slide is we had somebody who wasn't interested in the bird itself, but was interested in ectoparasites. So that's the lice and the mites and the bugs that are living on the bug. So we're collecting those for him. Um, if you have a chance, the Evanston Library opens up banding to the, to the public and invites everybody to come see the birds and that. And I, I think the favorite of mine is little kids like the, the guy in the le uh, le uh, left. And he had his own little uh, journal. He reminded me of David. That's why I had to put him in of you know, sketching the bird and writing the behaviors and all that fun, fun stuff. So now you put them in the nest and they're going to be in there until they're about 45 days old. These guys I'd say about 35 days. So you just have a little bit of the down left on top of the head and the little pantaloons under the wings. By this point they're very active and wing flapping and you know they're ready to be taking their first flight. And the first flight is more of a glide down to another level. It's, I don't get it yet, um, so it's just take my luck and see where I end up. And a lot of time, the only thing down is ground. And if we're talking about our Waukegan site and you're at Illinois Beach and you can sit on the beach all day, that's fine. But what do you do with the one that lands in Union Station during rush hour? D doesn't he need a little briefcase under the wing or something? <laughs> Um, so part of the Evanston is wonderful. It has that whole group of people that are on Falcon Watch, and there's a nice lady, Deborah, who, who schedules her vacation around fledging time. And so we can watch when they land on it and get them to them immediately. Um, if there's any question of injury in that, we'll take them to the zoo or to wildlife rehabs. They can x-ray and make sure they're fine. And all we have to do is either put them on the ledge or if it's an inaccessible site, I could put them on the roof next door or somewhere, and the parents will find them. And then they spend the next about three weeks learning how to fly well. And when they're getting very aerobatic with each other, and this is nice fun where they sort of touch talons and toss each other in the air, that's mimicking behaviors they'll need later in life for defending a territory or courtship. Um, the parents will start feeding them a little less and less, and essentially they disperse into the area, and that's the end of the season. So now we're, we're at the end of June, beginning into July, by the time our, our younger fledging and now flying. And the population, when I started, we had zero, then we had one in, in 87, and now we have over uh, 22 breeding pairs. It's about 30 territories within the entire state. See the, the dots down by St. Louis? Those are actually on cliffs and that. So we have the urban population and we're getting the rural population back as well. So that's tremendous. Our goal when we started the reintroductions for Illinois was to have three pairs. All right, so just some fun things that, that, that I deal with. Uh, a lot of it in, like this is an opportunity to do education and some of it can be do, done through webcams. I can tell you looking at all four of those, none of those peregrines need help. So upper left, yes, they go to sleep, he's not blind. The one on the upper right, yeah, they lay down when they're hot. Um, 
if it was 90 degrees lower left, you'd want to take a bath too. So they'll be in the Lake Michigan along the shoreline. And they don't stride like people, but they do this hip hoppy kind of side to side walk. And so don't assume it has a broken leg. It might be just the behavior of the bird and walking. There are circumstances where we have to come in and help. The one on the left, you're back at the Evanston Library. Um, it eventually got out of the twine itself. If I had risked grabbing it, I would have prematurely fledged the bird behind it. So it was a little bit of a waiting game and am I going to have to grab two birds, but lucked out and grabbing none. The one on the right got himself stuck. Um, he did go through uh, rehab after I got him out of there and was fine, was seen at other sites. And it's not just me helping birds. You have to think of me as the liaison for the birds or the ambassador for the birds, whatever word you'd like to use, and to help the people understand what's going on and how do we live th with these birds that are now in our urban environment. So say you've got a condo along Oak Street Beach and you go to the Bahamas and you don't come back until April. Well, if they laid their eggs at the end of March, they're now in your flower pot on your balcony. So how do we deal with it? Some, uh, you know, embrace them, they're fine, and you can say, oh, look, that's great, they're in the flower pot, it's nothing, but I can tell you when they get older, you get this. <laughs> and it, this was our first flower pot nest, so it was a learning basis for me, too. I've learned we have to do this. And actually, the female is laying down in the flower pot. That's the difference. When they're on eggs, they're, they're tied to those eggs and staying right there. But as soon as they hatch, it's that defensive property that goes up a hundredfold. And we find a lot because some engineer, poor engineer, had to go out and check the satellite dish, and the bird was swooping at him. Again, you want to stay as much as you can. This, if you were in a fun one in birding crowds, is to, OK, they were doing birds by looking at them and calls and that. If you were birders, could you do the one through five by just a feather or two? And there is your answer. So they eat a, a diverse amount of, of birds. Think of migration is going on right now. They're going to take advantage of the birds that are migrating through. So it's not just pigeons that they are eating. It's other birds. Bat would be the one mammal. Um, why do I want to study that and keep track of that? What if they're feeding on a neotropical migrant like an oriole? Now, we don't use DDT in the U US anymore, but we make it and export it to other countries. So if they're feeding on birds that winter in countries that are using that, is that still make it into their system? Um, because they're banded, and that sometimes through observations you'll know, you know who the male is, who the female is. We've had some instances of inbreeding, and which were productive. That was mother and son that were paired. Okay, I, I got a kick out of the Labrador duck in, in mistaking it for um, being such when it was really a, a mallard. So I thought I'd tell you some of the fun ones, peregrine-wise, that we've come across. Um, I got a call from a gentleman who took takes the L every morning. And he says, I'm seeing this peregrine on a church, and, and every day it's on a different part of it. You have to come down and check it out. So we went down and checked it out. And what it, was it? The church was loaded with plastic great horned owls. And I got a call from another guy who actually worked in a building that had peregrines. And it was fledging time, so I'm always worried. And he said, oh, one of the young died. You know, it's small, it's brown, and the beak is right. The beak is right. So I'm like, OK, I'll come down and pick it up. It was a woodcock. <laughs> the beak is right. I didn't laugh till I got on the elevator, so I thought it was restraint on my part. And, and the last one, you can get ones that are spot on. They describe a raptor. They describe it being bands, a black over black band, something that we use in peregrines. And it's like, ooh, so close, but it's a Cooper's hawk. So you get really particular on features. On a peregrine, those wings would come down to the tip of the tail. It doesn't have the mallard stripe on the front. Um, if you could see the bars on the tire, they're very wide in that. I used to not believe anybody. Now I believe most people up in time, time till I see that cell phone picture and can identify something like a Cooper's Hawk or what it is. So last thing to wind this up, because I know what you really want to see is Molly to come out, is how do we reach out to people? Uh, um, we do a lot through our website and um, Facebook page and that. Um, if people want to see a, if you're out birding and taking photographs, look at the legs, see if you can see the bands. There's a website where you can look it up yourself. Uh, six months after we put the Facebook page together, we're followed by people in over 50 countries in the US. 
it, it gives a global reach to what before had just been a local reach to us, which, which is tremendous. One of the most recent things is um, a book that's it's available for pre-sale online now, but it's not coming up to June or July. Uh, it's on this whole Illinois Peregrine story in the recovery. And the only way the book came apart is from through your local artist, Peggy McNamara. And I don't know if you saw her exhibit that had been at the um, Art Center in Evanston, but it's tremendous. Um, so it's her illustrations all the way through that um, tell that Peregrine story. And I should tell you that the Field Museum is going to do an exhibit of those paintings that will be open at the end of June. So I would encourage you to come to the museum and you'd be able to see that artwork and get a copy of the book, of course. The last thing I want to wind up with, okay, my David's passion was birding in the film and mine has learned to be peregrines. But this is Earth Day and happy Earth Day, everybody, by the way. Um, but it's all about making that connection somehow, whatever your interest might be to nature. And it doesn't have to be anything big. Maybe you like plants and, and you want to save the local little park that has these ferns in them. Maybe you're just into recycling or you want to do, kids can do a, a program to maybe change something at the school about recycling paper or whatever it might be. There's a really neat thing, birds get into trouble with those. You buy a six pack of pop and the plastic rings that are around them. Do you know there's ones that are biodegradable that if they get in water that fish can eat? Coolest thing. If we can, you know, find whatever neat thing that you get passionate about and then carry that for, forward. And every day, if everybody did one small little thing, you can make a huge difference um, going on. So, all right, I'm going to bring Molly out. And then if you guys have questions and you want to come see her, um, we'll do that. Okay, so remember when I told you to keep in mind the whole puppet? What they were doing with those eggs that they had collected from the wild eggs and when they hatched is you need to keep them from um, imprinting on people. If they see you feeding them all the time, they're going to think food comes from people, right? So seeing that puppet with that immature or that sort of peregrine head is what kept it um, from happening. Well, that's the exact thing that happened to Molly is that somebody tried to make her a pet. And right when she should have been learning what to hunt, where to hunt it, she's being fed by people. Um, so physically, this bird is fine. She's anxious to get out, too. I did one program somewhere, and I'm going to step down. That's going to drive me nuts. I did a program somewhere that had a skylight, and all of a sudden she starts yelling, and, and everybody's looking at me, and I'm like, I don't know what she sees, and then we all did this. And then about five minutes later, um, an eagle flew over the top. They're amazing what she can see. The, she is a better alarm bird than my German shepherd in the picture. If um, a cat comes in, the, uh, you know, one of the feral cats running around the neighborhood comes around, she lets out a scream. Something in her still recognizes that as a predator. Um, if a person comes being imprinted, you know, a guy comes in the backyard, suddenly she's bowing and she's e-chumping and she's making some vocalizations in that. She's probably going to watch if she bends forward and the wings come out a little and the tail comes out, that's usually a sign of pooping. <laughs> it's, a new, it's a new place for her to see. It's like, hmm, can I, can I sit up there? Can I sit over there? Um, probably not because uh, Piper's not, that's the shepherd, is not barking. What she recognizes focused on what I got. So, again, that's the whole... And that's begging, begging behavior. So, so 
时候。flown her in my own free flight chambers, which meant, you know, they're only the, the top beam she go, go up is about 10 feet high. She's capable of flight. But the whole problem is, if you were to let her go, ultimately she would starve to death on that. I'm going to go back and I'm going to flip something else on the screen. It's a little video clip and I want to show you that courtship behavior. She loves my colleague Tom. Tom and uh, that's if I can, um, I'll do that and I'll come back and do questions. Do you think that will connect to sound? Uh, you want to sound it too? Yeah, yeah. Do you think that will work? Well, I'll give it a minute. Oh, I, I'm just throwing them off for a loop because I didn't tell them I was going to do sound and that. Um, did you have a question? Who did I pass that was going to ask me a question? You did, sir. Mm -hmm. With her talent in the air, couldn't she catch birds? She doesn't know that that's what she's supposed to do or, or whatever. She would be more coming to your backyard and sort of doing that begging behavior or rushing at you because you're out grilling and there's a hot dog and she thinks that's a piece of meat that would throw to her. The problem is she doesn't really know where and what to hunt. Not that she doesn't have the behavior or instinct to sort of grab at it, Okay. But it's just sort of. Then how, and the parents who say take off, so how does she learn to hunt? Well, if, told you, tail up and the bend forward is pooping. Um, in a wild peregrine, while they can figure it out for themselves, if they have parents around, one, they can learn by watching them. Um, they learn a little bit of flight because the parents might not, instead of going to the nest and giving you your food, I'm going to sit over here and you've got to fly to me. So they, they do that sort of things to get them better at flying. And there's something about them. Um, peregrines, when they eat something, like to pluck, 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 pluck. So the parents bring them food. When they're really little, they'll do it for them. When they're bigger, usually that about 35-day-old slide, they're grabbing it from the adult and ripping it apart themselves. So when they start doing things like taking the branch off a tree in and plucking it like they would prey or, or being defensive over the prey and mantling and things like that. Parents will feed them a little less and a little less and then they have that instinct to go and um, grab it on their own. Thank you. Sure. Could she be trained to fly? I, I guess she can't hunt and come back to you so that she could fly like the way you could you, you, you could do something on lures. What you're doing is training to a whistle and a lure or something, and you work with somebody else. She asked about training her to fly from person to person type of deal. Um, yeah, I could put a glove on you, and I've got the glove, and you give a call, and, you've got, and she's learned that there will be a little meat there, and she comes and grabs it. But what... No, no, not really. You're talking, um, what does she do when she's not hungry then and she gets away from me and then doesn't find me, you know? Then she doesn't come back and she ends up that. There, it would be too, you're putting the bird at too much risk in that situation. The indoor free fly chamber gives her something to do. Yes, she can't soar like she, a wild bird would, um, you know, it's, it's a very, I understand, and it's an extremely difficult thing to see a bird that's so magnificent, magnificent and should be wild and can't be wild. And if anything, there's a part of me that likes that because what's going to make an impression on, you know, kids and that, it's not the pretty slides I showed before. It's seeing her and seeing those circumstances. Sometimes, now, her problem was intentional. Somebody tried to keep her as a pet. They had flight feathers pulled out. Um, Sometimes it happens with the best intentions. You feed birds in your backyard, you have these big trees, a cooper's hawk is nesting in that tree. Storm comes by, tree blows over, the adults get killed. You know that's a raptor, you know it could eat like raw chicken or something. You're going to feed it for the couple days till it's strong enough to take on. You're doing the wrong thing at the wrong time. You're, you're doing that imprinting. So you need to get injured wildlife 
to a licensed rehabilitator who knows how to take care of them. There's actually two holes in there, a hole that goes into the esophagus and, and one in the trachea. So you've got breathing and feeding. And if you try to force feed and stuff it down the wrong hole in the mouth, you could be suffocating the bird. So again, you, you know. All right, I'm going to see. Did, did we figure it out? Can we try this? It's really short, but it's fun. So that's courtship and that. So it's bowing, it's vocalizations. Did, did anybody see the one peregrine in the movie? No, it's a tricky one. This is tr it took me watching this three times before I finally saw the peregrine. And it wasn't a real one. Was it in the notebook? That's a really good guess. No, but think along those lines. No, no, there was a kestrel, but you're very close because that was in the falcon family. So it was a smaller relative. When the dad's in the bedroom and that, talking to him, and you can, in looking at the blender and that, there's a poster on the wall. It's a peregrine. <laughs> like I said, three times watching before I saw that. We could sit here all day. We should have just watched her for an hour and a half, right? <laughs> Yeah. She is uh, nine years old. I think I said earlier, they can live up to 20 in, in captivity and that. So she's considered mi middle-aged. Um, I, I have a name for her, but it's not like a dog that comes when he calls and respond. I, he's, she's not tame. She's not a pet. She's a wild bird that unfortunately can't be wild anymore. But I, I call her Molly. I think she's just showing off. <laughs> is she at all affectionate with you? No. no. No, but I wouldn't expect her to be. She will court me because, again, being the imprint, um, she generally likes men better. Um, I also have a permanently disabled red-tailed hawk. So that has the same problem. That's an imprint. Somebody took them out of a nest. There's a big difference in species behavior. And that Think of somebody with high metabolism. Always on the go, all over the place. And I'm more like the red tail, which is low and, you know. Um, so when she's in her free flight chamber, all that equipment comes off and she can fly up. But for me to put it back on, if I was trying to hold her and do it, she would be biting me. Peregrine's bite, by the way. Um, so I need one of my colleagues from the museum to come down and you know, hold her for me, and I'll put the, you ever see falconry with the hood on? That keeps her a little quiet. I can put all the equipment back on. Now, the red-tailed hawk, yeah, no, I can, I can, he'll just stand there for me, and him, I can do this little, touch the little, you know, touch the little beak. Not with her. Know your species, know what you can do. You know, as long as I don't do anything stupid, do anything to hurt her or harm her, she's going to work well. Um, you didn't see it because I was behind you, but you're seeing it now. I'm sorry, I'm a hand talker. They go, you know, they just go. Um, so if you have a bird on the fist and you're doing this in its face all the time, it's not a happy bird. Um, so my brother built that little tabletop. Perfect. You know, people can see her and I can w wave my hands all I want. She belongs to me. I work at the Field Museum, but they're on personal permits of mine, so she'll go home with me. A house for a, a hawk, this is your new word for the day, is a muse, M-E-W-S, and that. So they have a big, long weathering yard, with, which is all screened in. In that case, she would be on a longer leash and it has a swivel so it doesn't get tied up, um, but has a bath pan and a little dog loo. Um, so I have red tail at one end, peregrine at the other. Never the twain shall meet because they're not meant to be together, you're a different species. And then the back half of it is separated off to two chambers, so they both have their own free flight chamber to be in. Uh, you know, no, they tolerate. They've gotten used, they know how far, when a, a hawk jumps off the perch down, they call that baiting. Um, they know how far they can bait, exactly how far they can go. I had the red tail when I first got the house, and this is going back to 90. I got her in 19, him in 1990. Then I got a um, 
German Shepherd, not the one you saw, but a different one. Didn't like each other, you know, they would let out a territorial yell. Now the dog is trained not to go near the birds, but they're in the screening yard so they can't meet anyway, but they can sort of be nose to nose. Um, Abby, 10 years later, passes away. I get this one now, the red tail's baiting towards this one because somebody else has taken over a person. They get used to each other. I get into the new shepherd, that was Piper, by the way, and looks exactly like Abby did. Now the red tail is courting Piper like you wouldn't believe. He's, whenever she comes in the yard, it's at the screen, it's the bowing, the whole thing. Um, the red tail is a male, I, I call him Denver. He is 27 years old. 35, so he's sort of middle-aged. So when I do talks with him and that, I tell everybody the story and say how I was uh, dumped for a younger, prettier girl. <laughs> if you want, if, the, if people don't have questions or whatever, you can come up to the front of the stage. Don't try to reach it, but you can take a picture a little closer. And I'd say if you want to talk to me, fine, or feel free, come go. I, I yeah. see It's a, it's a little hot. Part of it is, um, see that behavior? They call that rouse, R-O-U-S-E. That's a sort of comfortable shaking thing. If she was really stressed, you would hear um, a different vocalization and you would see shaking. So a little bit the warm is, is new people checking out the place, jumping back and forth. They need to eat like they would in the wild. So that means they need to be eating fur, feather, bones. Now, fur, not normally for a peregrine because they're eating other birds. See, that's telling you you're as good as close as you need to go. That little <laughs> eh, eh, eh. Um, So I get game-raised quail, feed her. She'll actually eat when I, I take her home. Uh, What's our world population? That has come a lot back up. I don't really know world numbers. I could tell you, you know, as far as that Midwestern Eastern numbers, when you were in the 300 to 350, we're probably around 400, we're 450. We're past what historic levels were. You could see that in the map of Illinois right there. She, she would go and want to sit on one of the lights and sit up high or something. Yeah. That's a little bit of what she's checking out is because we're at the beginning of the season and she's just recently coming out of the free flight chamber where she could go up to the beam all the time. Yes. But they, oh, they all, both of them do that when they're, um, yeah, yeah, but it's checking out a new place. A lot of the head bowing, this little constant this, is focusing the eyes. You know, if you were to tape a newspaper to the back wall, she could read it. I can't read it in front of me with barely with my glasses, but phenomenal eyesight. And if you look closely, can you guys out front, and you look at her nose, this is a fun paragraph fact for you. You look in the nostril and you see a little cone. I'm sure most of us have been flying in a jet, right, airplane? And you can picture the big engine on the side with the cone in it. When engineers, in, in the airplane industry, we're trying to figure out flight. They mimic the nostrils and the structure in a peregrine falcon. What that cone does is if you're flying at speeds, now they can dive at speeds of over 200 miles an hour when they're catching their prey. You're going that fast, the air is gonna zip over that nostril and not go in, it's gonna suffocate. If it was a plane, the engine dies of oxygen. So it hits that cone and forces it in the nostril and then inside are all these little baffles that help reduce the speed, speed that make it easier for us to breathe. That's the same thing now, when picture the gen engine with the cone with all the little louvers. They learned that from the Peregrine. Mm. Fun fact for the day. Why don't we have flights like in England, you know, where you've got the, the, the birds hunting? You, well, you, I, I'm not sure what you mean. You know, falconry? Yes. There, there is a very active falconry com community. Um, are you online? Google the Great Lakes Falconers Association. And that oh, some of the people that do rehab, in fact, the ones that trained Molly to the fist and first worked with her before I got her, um, are falconers. Yeah. 
Yeah. And so they so, do flights. Oh, sh sure, sure. I'm not a falconer, so I have her on education permits. Yes, I could fly her on that kind of permit, but I can't hunt with her. Mm -hmm. If you're talking about something like uh, a peregrine, usually you're, uh, a falconer will be hunting with a dog, and you have the dog run through the field and Drive kick the up the birds up, sure. and then your peregrine takes it out. Something like my red tail, you're hunting rabbits. Yeah. Using a bird instead of a gun. Yeah. 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 My, my sister did that, uh, went out with that in, in England. She oh. said it was just magnificent yeah. watching yeah. birds. Yeah. You, they have events, places or something where some are. In fact, I, I knew the talk last weekend that, where they did it out in Lockport near me. But um, they just had their falconry birds out. They weren't mm -hmm. flying them. But they some, have them at the, the um, Renaissance here, too. Usually. Yeah, a lot of those can be falconry birds, but you don't know. They could be like me with an education bird. Yeah? I was just thinking about all that because I've read that research from Hawks Book. And, and yeah. It's really taking birds that fly in the yeah, yes, yes and no. You, you can, yes, and, and it's very permitted and what you can take and where and, and, and whatnot. Um, so you'd be taking a passage bird. There's enough of the signs going on to reinforce that to how many permits are allowed to take what. So for all the 30 years, you know, there was no take on falconry and peregrines in the whole time they're listening to, no, no. So that, that's very regulated. Well, yeah, there's one allowed in the state, one bird in a year. So still extremely regulated even though it began. And you're talking a passage bird. That's, that's a percentage of it. The other one is they still breed them in captivity. So as a falconer, you might want an imprint. So you can go and buy a peregrine chick and have it imprinted on you and that and work with it. Now that bird is not releasable to the wild. You really need to contact like the Great Lakes Falconers Association. I'm just saying, I'm not a falconer, so my knowledge is like, mm, you're, you've got almost the max of it. That's a controversial discussion. A falconer might tell you that you have a bird that's wild, that even though they've trained it, it knows how to be wild and can be wild again. Me as a scientist wants to say, well, where's the scientific study that you followed that bird that you released to prove that, or that when it's stressed, it's not doing that? Um, so it's a little bit of give and take. You really need to talk to a falconer to explain it more. And, and then again, both sides.